Okay, we'll start now as close as we can. We give everybody an extra minute. So, first of all, welcome. This is going to be the three week series for this year. And as you see, the title is going to be From Bubble to Barcelona and Fez to Frankfurt, the Powers of the Jewish Courts Throughout the Diaspora. That's not my phraseology, as Shmuel Tarshish is, it's a little florid for me. But nevertheless, he earned the right, as you'll see in a second. First, I want to start, as I always do, by thanking their Tumman and Rabbi Motz and everybody else for hosting us. It's very kind of them. Right? I'll be doing, in return, I'll be doing the Tisha above here, the uh, Tino's. Mm -hmm. Number two, I want to thank tonight's sponsor, which you can see here, the Newberg's is Mayor Newberger. Shragi called me up to say, it's not me. <laughs> um, and number three, I want to thank Bill and, and, and Howard and everybody, all the tech team, and Paul and Yossi and everybody at Howard. Um, for coming in and putting this together as always. And finally, um, and it's not here yet, but this whole uh, series came together in a funny way, thanks to a Shmuel Tarshish who wrote to me and he says, was there coercion in this and this time? I said, yeah, what about this and this time? Yeah. Why don't you do a series on that? I said, do a series easy to talk, you know? It means I gotta go and schlep and round up the sponsors. He said, I'll take care of that. He called me back an hour or two later. He said, I got all the sponsors. So, you know, money talks. <laughs> okay? Some people, some people are, uh, are full of ideas and some people actually actualize. And so because of that, he certainly deserves, as you can see at the bottom, I mentioned over there, on, on the sign anyway, that um, this series is sponsored uh, by him. I mean, in other words, inspired, that's a better word. Inspired by him. And uh, he wanted me to mention about his dad, but he's not here now, so I'll wait till he comes and then I'll say a few words next time when he's here. Um, his father actually taught history in high school. So without any further ado, <coughs> we're talking about the three weeks lecture series of 2022 called The Powers of Jewish Courts Throughout the Diaspora. That's basically what it boils down to. The first lecture is tonight entitled Jewish Courts in the Islamic World, The Problem of the Impenetrable Talmud Babli. Okay? Okay, very good. Now, I'm going to get, jump right into this. The topic is based in and its powers throughout Jewish history at different times and in different places. That's a very large topic. We're going to scratch the surface. Speaking as I am to an American audience, right off the bat, you've got to understand there never was such a thing as we have today in America. Based in without a kahila behind it, without a formal kahila of which the based in is an official arm. The courts because we don't have any Cahill in Baltimore, Maryland, let me tell you that right now. Every shul makes Shabbat for itself. Okay? Nobody's telling my shul what to do, and I'm not telling your shul what to do. True or not? Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So the courts, as we shall be learning about in this, in this series of mine, the basins, as we call throughout history, were communal courts. Courts which were a formal part of a legally recognized community. The judges were salaried by the community. A Cahilla which was like a mini municipal government with the legal powers of a government. Again, in this country, as you know, we have separation of church and state. No church, synagogue, or anything like this has legal power over any members. You want to walk out any time, you do whatever you want. That's called Thomas Jefferson. Okay? No shul, no church, no, no mosque can make you do anything. But that's not the way it was. Um, I, I'm talking about a kahila, which throughout history, enjoyed the power to legislate, which again, we don't have anything like that today, okay? Legislate on the local level, never on the Prince Jewish level, as we shall see. This is so important. A Kahila whose legislation added to and modified the existing Talmudic laws, right? Whose legislation defined the powers of the particular Kahila as an institution whose legislate, you get what I'm saying? We get together and we elect a board in some fashion or other, and then we write our stickle constitution, whatever you want to call it in those days, and we define how much power we give ourselves. Whose legislation also defined the makeup and the powers of the base din, or the set of bati din, because in many communities, as we shall see, they had multiple courts, what we would call today small claims court, large claims court, um, courts dealing with uh, uh, marriage and divorce solely, things like that, because we have a larger community 
It is a matter of, of, of efficiency. Whose legislation defined which cases were to be adjudicated in the Kehillah's based in, and which cases were not to be adjudicated in the Kehillah's based in. In other words, they would be adjudicated by the board of directors or by some group empowered by the Kehillah, not by the Jewish community's law court. These were part of the constitutions in the different places in different times in Jewish history. So, for example, you know, to jump the gun a little bit, in any place in Italy in the 1700s, there was some business arguing between two people. That's a special board of businessmen. They are, quote unquote, the basin, we want to call it like that, because they understand the ins and outs of that business, of the, being a merchant, all the rest of it. The case does not land in what you call based in, it lands in that particular arbitration board, or where it's, it's not an arbitration board. I mean, their rules were followed. So, um, Closest thing I can imagine off the top of my head, I'm sure they have some kind of system, if, the, if it's still around the Hasidic diamond business in, in the New York and those places, they have their ways of settling things that don't go to regular basin. Now, by the way, this is not a violation of our cause. We're not talking about going to Gentile courts. That's a different problem throughout Jewish history from then till today. That's a different issue. I'm not dealing with that. I'm talking about going to different types of Jewish courts, or better yet, um, boards which decide legal matters which are not based in, but they're empowered to do so by the Kehillah, which once upon a time existed and no longer exists. I'm talking about a Kehillah with an elected board of directors, because there was always uh, some kind of election. Now, not the way that we understand necessarily election today. Usually it's an oligarchy, you know, and the kind of way elections were long ago unlike the free and unfettered and fair elections that we have in the state of Maryland. You know? um, but the point is that whoever was the board of directors was subject to election, to re-election, and to unelection, as is true of elected officials in this country. We don't have any of this that I just described in America. Nothing like it. So based in today, by us, is very different. It's weird in many ways. It's very wounded, actually. And it's not functioning as part of a larger system of government, I mean an actual government, like the city government of Baltimore, the state government of Maryland, the national government of the United States of America. The whole idea of government, of legislature, implies the ability to respond to new circumstances by legislation, not simply to say, what does the Gemara say about this? <laughs> we'll be very clear about this. You know, the issue of Takonas and Xeris and this and that and the other. Now, this is a complex matter, after all. I mean, it's not open season. A Kehillah can't simply cancel or change a law in Shas. It depends. You know, I mean, a Kehillah couldn't say, we now cancel the prohibition of eating a ham sandwich. That's Reform Judaism. I'm not talking about any of that. Right? They didn't say you can be Michal Shabbos. On the other hand, what I just said about eating a ham sandwich is what we call Isura, ritual law. Things are different when it comes to Mamona, which is financial laws which admit of far greater modification, simply because we have a rule in the Talmud, Mamon is Yavla Mechila, and therefore have Kabez and Hefker, that whenever there exists an obligation of one person to another, a financial obligation, it is possible, I didn't say you do it, to forgive the debt. So since it's possible to forgive the debt, it's possible to make the whole crime or problem go away. That itself weakens the nature of the Isser. This is what they call Tosfus. You understand? And it makes it possible to legislate around it. And we have concepts here for Hefker, based and Hefker, that a certain basin in certain conditions can confiscate money, declare it ownerless, declare money you own not yours. You can't do this with Isura. We can't say, this is not a piece of ham. <laughs> right? It's a piece of steak. <laughs> Just reclassified it. Can't do that. Today's not Shabbos. Can't do that. See? But with money, you can play more games. Here, Kehillahs could legislate in the area of Mominus to change the rules of the Gemara, and they did, which is why we have a very famous rule in the Talmud, which means just because the rule applies by money matters, you don't apply it to ritual matters. Something that's permitted in Mominus doesn't mean, and often is the case that it's not, the same thing in ritual matters. You know, same, just because you're lenient, for example, for example, in this financial thing, you can't play those games, like I said before, with Hel Shabbos, things of that nature. Of course, when there's a mixture 
of Yisurim Amona, as for example, by Afkos Kedushin, it usually got very legally complicated. There's a wonderful book, can't see it so well, Tater Kedushin, known as Suim, by Avram Freiman, who was a famous law professor in Germany, a from guy, and then he was a law professor in Hebrew, then he was killed by the Arabs. Remember that convoy where they killed the nurses on the way to Jerusalem? Yeah, see, that's right. So he was a professor. So he, he was, he, that's not true. It's a different place. So anyway, the, the, the point is, um, they wrote a wonderful book in 1945, where he deals with all the attempts to legislate and try to deal with a fundamental problem that we'll probably come across later over here. And that's the problem of the fact in Jewish law, Talmudic law, which is Isura that it's too easy to get married and too hard to get divorced. Mm-hmm. It's too easy to get married, too hard to get divorced. Mm-hmm. To get married, all you need is a boy and a girl, and 13 years old, whatever, and he gives her a little thing, and she says yes, and there are two people standing by, two guys, it's done. Which uh, 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 admits for a lot of abuse. You get it? And we all know it's very hard to get divorced. So you got the Laguna problems and all this stuff. So the Basins, you know, try to wrestle with this, and he has a wonderful history of this. Different times in different places, one of the tactics you use, doesn't always work, is to confiscate the money from the guy or something like that. That's Talmudic. That Afkin or Abundant Kedusha, you know, that they say the money he gave her doesn't count. But again, it's a mixture of the two sorts of law, Yisurim and Mona, and therefore Jewish courts were uh, messing with this and still are. And of course, that Kehla can always prohibit something permitted under Talmudic law. It can be more machmer, right? That's not considered violating Talmudic law. This is why, as you know, the Syrians over there in New York and Deal, they say you can't marry any gear. We've all heard this, right? Uh, they can do that. You see? If they make a kill, you know, they're not breaking the law by being more strict. So it's a little bit radical, but OK. That's an example. Of the, uh, they did this in 1920 or whatever, of saying, you know, for our kill, we're, we're passing a law. You see? And it's an example of that. Um, as we shall see, Kehilos did a lot of legislating, but only on the local level and not on the Klal Yisrael level, because there was no authority in Judaism after the Talmud. No one was considered having the power to uh, be able to tell any other community what to do. And it's very much like John C. Calhoun you know, where every kill is insisted on states' rights. So Berlin can't tell Frankfurt what to do, Frankfurt can't tell Berlin what to do, not even going to try. Rome is not going to tell Venice what to do, and Venice is not going to tell Rome what to do. You see? Because every state has its rights. So that was the world in which they lived. So if it was felt in the communities that it was necessary to go against the law and the Torah in, those, in the old days, or go around the law and the Torah, if there was a consensus that included the Talmudists, the, the, the scholars, well, we have Prisbal, we have Ribbis stuff, Hatteriskas, things of that nature. Very recently, as you know, we have Rav Cook with the Hatter Mechira around the problem of Shemitah. Some of these things are more controversial, some of these things are less controversial. Hillel pulled it off with the Prisbal, right? And uh, the Hatteriska <laughs> has gotten more and more to the left, if you know the history of that issue, in, especially in 15, 1600s. And then they got away with it. So Jewish courts, historically, always exist, existed within a dynamic halachic framework. The Kehillahs couldn't just go against the Torah, but the Talmudic Chachamim in the courts, or the rabbinate, were there to provide expert legal advice as to what could be legislated. And like I said before, you can't cancel the law of ribbons, but you can devise uh, runarounds. But the different have to risk is the way they got it worked out now is like no risk, you see? So... These were part of Jewish life century after century. And that's the point. Um, now, though these lo- uh, scholars, local scholars, did live within and had to take into account, always, the international community of Torah scholars and their consensus, which is the stuff of Jewish historians. So it could be some rabbi or some judge or somewhere said, you know, in our community we really need to pay us such a thing. And the other guy said, I guess, the whole world will go against this. All right, forget it. What's the whole world? Legally, nobody can tell you what to do. But you live in a world 
You see, you live in a world of Jewish communities. They didn't have a government, a single government. They didn't have a state. They didn't have geographical contiguity. They didn't have a church authority. But they lived within that consensus. And usually, wanting to live within that consensus kind of constrained wild and radical innovations. Usually, not always. Um, so anyway, it was different than today. That's the point I'm trying to get at. In addition, in many places, especially in the Middle Ages, local custom, what you call minhag, from pre-Talmudic times, had the force of law even over Talmudic law and was thus applied by the basin. This requires that I should give you a certain background. The institution of Bezdin, as you understand the term, emerged at a somewhat late date in the 3,000 year his old history of Judaism. It started in the Bayashani period, Second Temple period, when for the first time, significant numbers of Jews lived outside of Israel. What we call the Golot, the, the diaspora. Right? Think about it. Until then, let's say the Bayash Rishon period, the biblical period, all the Jews live in Israel. I didn't say they were perfect. I didn't say they were tzaddikim. They had their issues, blah, blah, blah. All Jews live in Israel. You know, I'm sure a few lived elsewhere. But you know what I mean? 99.9% .9 of Jews live in Israel. The way most Frenchmen live in France, the way most Germans live in Germany, and so forth. However, as we all know, after the base of Mesh was destroyed, we're now in the three weeks, by his reach in the first temple, Jews went off to Bavel, and they didn't all come back. They did not all come back. When you had the beginning of the second era, a relatively small number of people, they say 45,000, <coughs> came back on these aliyahs. You know, Thomas Rubabal and Ezra and all that. A fairly small number. And even if that number was augmented later on by something of an aliyah, which seems to have been a case, nevertheless, most likely the majority of the Jews lived outside of Israel. That's a radical new reality. Never existed before. The Torah wasn't written with that in mind, so to speak. The Torah, as you know, is written with the idea of you know, this is what you do. It doesn't say in the Torah if you ever get kicked out. Now, by the way, it says you will one day sin and you will get kicked out, but it doesn't tell you what to do. <laughs> There's a tochacha. It doesn't tell you what to do. Now, the Judaism of the Bible is centered around temple rituals performed by priests. Isn't that right? I mean, let me put it this way. According to the Bible, how do you celebrate Shavuos? There's no staying up and learning. There's no cheesecake. There's no milk eggs. There's no abdomas. What is Shavuos? And it's one day, of course. What is Shavuos? The answer is, it goes on in the temple. They have a special carbon performed by the priest called the Shtei Alechem and this and that and the other. And thus he does. So let's say I'm a farmer and I live 50 miles or 100 miles or whatever away from the temple. I don't see any of that. And same thing is true for most of the holidays. What is Rosh Hashanah? What's Rosh Hashanah? I'm serious now. And according to the Torah, by its regional period, if you're a farmer, you lived long ago, it's no apple and honey. <laughs> right? What was Rosh Hashanah? There's no davening. Davening didn't exist. As the Rambam says, formal prayer began to begin, formal prayer began with Ezra and Nehemiah in the time of the uh, Bayashani. So what was it beforehand? By the way, there were no brachas. You ate a food, you didn't make a bracha. Right? So what was Rosh Hashanah? You see where I'm going. Now, there is a commandment to blow a shofar. So the farmer wakes up and somewhere in the day, by the way, you don't have to get up early for chakras. No chakras. Okay? Some people will look upon that as a golden era. <laughs> um, so, but, so what was it? Midaraisa. You know what I'm saying? The answer is, the, as far as the individual is concerned, you just have to get a chauffeur. Which, by the way, if we want to get down to it, is do, 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 right? I mean, you know, it's, it's three blasts. It's tekiah, true tekiah, times three. It's a total nine blasts. And they knew it. They didn't do the 30 and the 100. I'm talking, again, Minatora. And second of all, no, there is no second of all. That's it. You see? And so the main action happens in the temple, where there are a number of prescribed ritual sacrifices for that day. And so on and so forth. So I'm simply trying to show you that the Judaism that you and I live today is radically different than what it once was. We pray for the restoration of it, and nobody has an idea what it's going to look like if there is a restoration of it, because does it mean if the base of Mesh is destroyed, all, I mean if the base of Mesh is rebuilt during the three weeks, all the shuls are going to go out of business? 
She thinks that's funny. Now, anyway, the, 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 so what's going on? There was no Dalvin, no Brahma. So how do you practice Judaism in the diaspora? There was no precedent. And so the Jews who lived in different areas, especially once the Greeks came in, Alexander the Great, you know, roughly speaking, without getting into the details, let's say the base of Mesh was destroyed in the 580s BCE. I don't want to get into dating issues. Um, Alexander the Great would be about 200 years later. I mean, actually, uh, more than that, in the 330s, 320s BCE. Uh, that's what we call Second Temple period. When the Greeks come in, the Jews move and live all over the Eastern Mediterranean. In what you and I today call Lebanon, Turkey, Egypt, Greece, those kind of places, Tunisia, lots of Jews. So how do you practice Judaism in the diaspora? The Jews in the different localities of the Hellenistic world evolved somehow or other. <laughs> Number one, they involved certain ways of practicing Judaism. Because if a bunch of Jews lived in Athens, they didn't simply say, okay, no brachas, no set. You move somewhere, you want to eat sufficient yidin. That's just a natural tendency. We like to get together, have some kind of Jewish club, right? Uh, and so they created the kahila. You see, whether it's in Alexandria in Egypt, whether it's in Athens, whether it's in what we call today Turkey at that time, Asia Minor, or Italy or other places like that. Obviously, they felt the need for group existence because otherwise it wouldn't happen. Um, they created a new institution that never existed before called the synagogue, which is a Greek word, right? In which we have something called davening, which I just told you starts only this time. Never had davening before. So, so many institutions that you and I take for granted today, they back to a period when these were new experimental ideas. Uh, they had to develop, and they did develop, if you're going to have some kind of a community, some sort of system of internal law and order, the peaceful regulating of behavior. What if me and he and I get into argument over who owns the sitter? I mean, how do you settle that? You know what I'm saying? Um, I know what some people think. They, uh, you get it, there has to be some sort of way. In other words, some sort of judicial system. That's what I'm going for. They had to develop in these communities, as they were evolving, some way in which you have some kind of judicial system. This is an informal process of evolution in Greek times and later in Roman times. It was here in these communities that there started what we call Shabbos prayers, ceremonies, Kriya Satora, in Greek, by the way, in those days, was Metorgamus. That's what they say, you know, in Greek. Uh, Davening, by the way, for Israel and Yerushalayim. Now that you live in Rome, but you daven towards Israel, and you pray for the base of You send them money. All those things started long ago in these communities. These communities early on acquired certain powers from the Hellenistic and the Roman state. It started with the, with the power to assess and collect taxes. That's kind of obvious. The state wants money, uh, unlike the American government today, right? Yeah, right. And the state wants money, always. Uh, they have a bunch of Jews living in different places. The easiest way for them to deal with this was to say, we look at the Jews as a group, and collectively we figure you guys are worth two million bucks a year in taxes. I don't care how you put it together. If you got one guy who's willing to foot the bill for everybody else, fine, I don't care. Which is not going to happen. I was telling you. What's actually going to happen is the three richest guys are going to figure out some way to screw the others and make them pay them taxes, which is the way it always goes in history. It was like that with the Jews also. But the fact is that um, the state in order to make this an efficient system, would say to the Jewish community, whether in Alexandria in Egypt, whether in Asia Minor, whether in Macedon, you know, all those places, uh, you guys are the Jews here. We figured it's 500 of you. Organize yourselves into a corporation, or whatever you want to call it, and this corporation has to deliver 2 million bucks in cash <laughs> on January 1, which the Jewish community was willing to do. But it means that the state is therefore going to have, in order to make this work, it's going to have to empower the leaders of that group, whoever the board of directors, whatever you want to call them, with the power to assess those taxes and make them pay paid. Because he's going to say, I don't want to pay your taxes. You're rich than me. Why? You know all that. If you want it to happen, okay, then you're going to have to. So assessing and collecting taxes met, met a Gentile need, but it dovetailed 
with an inner, organ inner organic Jewish need and dynamic for self-organization into a government, not just a club, not just a club. In order to understand this, you have to remember Judaism, even though this is not an American type thing, Judaism is a coercive business. The Torah doesn't just have do's and don'ts. The Torah prescribes penalties for violations. So the Torah assumes that a Jewish community will have some kind of power structure, which will enforce the Torah's laws through penalties for noncompliance. That's like in there, correct? It says, you know, whoever in Chal Shabbos gets stoned. Who decides that and who does the stoning? It's all implied, you see? In other words, a coercive power structure is basic to Judaism, whether you like it or not. And so it was no surprise that the collections of individual Jews who found themselves living in hell, some Hellenistic city or set of cities naturally came together in some form, not merely in a club the ways in America, because they say, again, in this country, we have total freedom, religion, separation, church, and state. It's not possible to do what I'm talking about over here. And I don't think any of us want it. We're Americans. You see? So we're modern in that way. But nevertheless, in those days, they came together in some kind of tight form, but a tighter structure with certain elements basic to Jewish thinking, which is, number one, everybody has to join. Number two, a group power structure must be erected to enforce the rules of Judaism. And number three, that power structure must have powers and tools of coercion. Actually, number four is also there, and it's very important. The power must be fair and equitable. Not just we're pointing one guy as Grand Puba, and he should be a little Hitler. Okay? It must be rational within the Torah's frame of, of, of thinking. It must not be arbitrary. Hence, there must be a judicial system of some kind whose procedures reflect equity and fairness. These are basic fundamental thinking from long ago. The requirement for equity and fairness derived from both internal as well as external sources. Internally, the Chumash itself requires all the time equity and fairness. There are a million verses in the Bible, Tarnavi Miksuvim, that there better be Mishpat. There better be fairness. What are all the prophets of Israel? By the way, it says in the Chumash itself, he says, if you mess over the widow and the orphan, this and that, I'll get you. And you have all the prophets who say, this country is going down. Because the judges are corrupt and they'll sell out a guy for a parachute to bribe. It doesn't even need to be a big bribe, just for a pair of shoes. So you have lots of blastings of what we call the lack of judicial equity. The court has to be fair. Okay? Um, externally, in a diaspora setting, an arbitrary exercise of power <coughs> would drive the local Jews out of the community. I'm not putting up with this. They would simply drop out, not attend the synagogue, all the rest of it. They'd go to uh, non-Jewish courts. Why should they go to Basin? It's a setup. And they would utilize whatever protection they had with the Gentiles to get out of their tax assessments and cancel and avoid any punishments. The Ark of Synagogue would impose upon them. The Ark of Synagogue were the arch synagogue, the uh, name for what you and I today called president of community, the Gaboim, you see? Thus, in a process of natural evolution, there developed numerous Jewish communities in the diaspora. The word diaspora means dispersion. In modern Israel, we call it tfutzot, like in Beit HaTfutzot. Old times, we call it gola. All of them assuming a similar character, more or less. No, this evolved. Nobody got together to organize it. So here is the world, at the time of Alexander the Great and the Hellenistic rulers and all this junk. And here it is, where, here's where a lot of Jews live. Now, there are also Jews here. And ba Bavel, which I'm pointing to right now, had a very thick Jewish population, but he had significant Jewish centers in Egypt. I think you've heard of the famous Jewish community in Alexandria. And up in Greece, and what today you call Turkey, that's then called Asia Minor, and along the coast over here, Antioch and the other places. Basically, it's simple. The Jews usually moved anywhere there's a port, by a big river or, or a Mediterranean Sea, for obvious reasons. How are you going to make a living? Make a living as a merchant of some sort or another, or in, in some ancillary, you know, thing connected with that. That means you want to near, be near a body of water because that's how you transport your stuff. So imagine the Eastern Mediterranean, in the time of the Maccabees, for example, uh, dotted with all kinds of little Jewish communities, some larger, some smaller, and each of these Jewish communities would have evolved some kind of form of what we call it, a shul, a synagogue, 
with some kind of form of prayers, with some version of other Kriya Satorah. As they say, usually not in Hebrew language, people couldn't speak Hebrew well. Usually with a lot of converts attending, by the way. And uh, also always with a pushka for Israel. I'm serious, at that time for Beis HaMikdash and that sort of thing. You know, this is, this is the life how it was once upon a time. And always with a local Jewish court of some form or another. Right? You know, they didn't call it this, they call it that. Some arbitrary, ar ar I mean, um, arbitration way or some other form of settling issues in the community. Okay? Because issues cry for being settled. And um, if issues are not addressed by courts, you have what you have in Baltimore, Maryland. Okay? So um, they more or less all had a similar character. Pretty soon, as you see in the next map, this spread farther with the Roman Empire, and the Jews followed the Roman Empire. I'm talking about the Jews in, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, here we go. You know, if the Romans took over this part, you can be doggone sure Jews moved over here, because now they're going to be ports. You see? And eventually the Roman Empire, this is the Republic. The Roman Empire, let's go to the next one. It is Roman Empire, see? How I many there'll be Jews up here? I think some of you follow in the newspapers that they found mikvahs from the Roman times up here on the Rhine. Right? I think in Mainz or maybe a Worms or one of those places. I mean, from Roman times. In, uh, in Vagabondium, in, in, in Vienna, even. These were the frontiers of the Roman Empire. Why would a Jew be on the frontier of the Roman Empire? Well, gee whiz. If it's a frontier of the Roman Empire, it means there's going to be a legion over there. It's going to be a legion. On Sundays, they get day off. <laughs> you know Go spend the money somewhere. Simple as that. Now, um, these are what we call the Medina Siyam. In the, in the time of the Mishnah and the Gemara, they say, I may be getting my Medina Siyam. That's what they mean. These places in the Roman Empire. In each one of these communities, there was usually some kind of board of directors. I'm using a Western term. In the Western diaspora, they call them the Archie Synagogi. Arch Synagogue, the arch, main guy of the synagogue. In Eretz Yisrael in Iraq. And later in the Middle Ages, they developed a whole variety of Hebrew names. So, um, you know, you'll see this in this farm. The Peneho Eida, that would be the, the board of directors. That's a very honorific name. The Parnasim, I think some of us have heard of a Parnas. Right, like in Europe, had Parnas Achodesh. Uh, the Shiva Tuva Ir is a halachic Mishnah concept, which means the official board of directors. You can't sell a shul unless the Shiva Tuva Ir agree. You see? Um, now, it doesn't have to be seven. That was the popular number at that time. It could be different numbers. The Pum Akrut Mene Eida. Mene Eida is a biblical term. This is Parnasim Manhigim, and this is Halufim, Katsinim, Roshim, Betobim. They gave themselves all these big honorific names. You know, the old line, why do you want this job? I do for the covet. Everybody's cursing you out. Yeah, I know, but I want the covet. <laughs> right. So the boards of directors had executive powers. I repeat, they had executive powers, not just legislative. They had legislated too. In fact, they legislated their own power which is kind of interesting, right? It's kind of interesting. You know, there's no constitutional limits, so to speak. You legislate your own power. Um, so you can imagine how that went. And as I said before, there was always some kind of election process, but in the nature of things, this happens with elections in all times and places. Unless you're really on your toes, it usually got rigged, and money played the most important part. We all remember the famous Dvar Torah of uh, Will Rogers. Now, the board of directors um, appointed the basin, or whatever they call it, whom they usually salaried in some form or another and could be fired at will. I'm talking about the Bayeshani period and the post, you know, in the Greek and Roman world. The board of directors could appoint themselves judges to adjudicate some type of cases, and they did, as I told you before. And it's not crazy either. Suppose this community is surviving, I don't know, on the jewelry trade. So the main thing is the jewelry. Well, me and him and him and him, we're the guys in the business. So if there's an argument between him and him, I mean, who can decide that? Because I'll say, when we made the contract, we went this and that and the other. I mean, an outsider doesn't get it, you see? And so they needed people from within that profession. That's the sort of thing that happened. Because um, after all, the judges in the diaspora, I'm talking about, did not go to law school. In all these diaspora communities, 
They did not judge by Talmudic law. Why did they not judge by Talmudic law? Talmud didn't exist. It came later. It didn't exist. Okay. Now, on the other hand, there couldn't be pure arbitrariness doesn't work. I explained that before. If it's pure arbitrariness, then the court loses all morals. Why are people not going to listen? They'll go around it and then undermine it. And so they had to slowly evolve norms, judicial and administrative. If you want, we can call these norms minhagim. After a decade or two, a generation or two, as you know, minhagim attain great authority. This is what my Bubba used to do. This is what my Zaydi used to do. Whenever they had a case over here, my great uncle, who was a famous guy, used to do this way. That's what we do here. You see? Now let's shift the focus for a moment to Eretz Yisrael, without, however, getting back, bogged down in historical details, which would take forever. Suffice it to say, because until now I was talking about the diaspora, what was going on in Israel at this time? Suffice it to say that in Eretz Yisrael there was, of course, a base of Megdush and a priesthood, which was practicing biblical Judaism, Kachim, Tyrus, Rum, the whole nine yards, Paraduma, everything, you know, all the rituals. But then there wasn't. As I say, now we're in the three weeks. After 70 AD, it's not there. Then there followed about five centuries of what we call the creation of the Talmud. Four or five centuries. Right? And so here's the book on the subject. We did it in Shul. You know, on Shuas. Gareth of Shuragon, how the Talmud came to be. The history of the text. How it, how it happened. But it's a book. Once upon a time, it didn't exist. And then it existed. Okay? I'm skipping all the details to get to the point with which we're starting our series today, which is around the year 600, 700, the, what we call the Middle Ages, beginning. That is when the title of this series will become relevant, because by that time, the Greco-Roman diaspora mode of community, with its government, its judiciaries, its synagogues, where it shows a communal asset, right? Not schools, interestingly. They never owned and regulated schools. That was always left to private enterprise. Uh, but shuls, which is, uh, anyway, th this form spread everywhere, just about everywhere. And the bipolar religio-political reality of the medieval world of three zones. Because by the time we get to Middle Ages, politics in the whole world has changed a lot with the rise of Christianity and Islam. And what you and I call the Middle Ages is defined as Jews live in three places in the early Middle Ages, uh, Team A, Team B, Team C. As we'll see, Jewish Kehillahs dot the map of these empires. So on the one hand, you had the Arab Empire. That's what's up there. The Caliphate, ruled by the Caliph, which was gigantic. Look what the Arabs conquered pretty doggone quick. They started in the 630s, and by 700, 712, they've got Spain. Okay? And... It's actually, this is India. So if you have one empire running from India to Spain, it's pretty big, as far as I'm concerned. And as you know, the Arabized it, the Islamized it, and all the rest of it, and the Jews are smack in the middle of it. And in fact, Rove of Kal Yisrael lived in the early Middle Ages, by far within the Arab world, what we, we call the Arab world. This is the creation of the Arab world. You know, these peoples over here weren't Arabs. They were Arabized. You don't need me to tell you the Egyptians have been around long before the Arabs. The Egyptians had a great civilization well, before the Arabs ever showed up, okay, uh, is gone. You go to Egypt today, nobody speaks ancient Egyptian, and they'll just show this as relics of a dead civilization. You know, the Egypt it's very interesting always to me, the Egyptians and the other peoples in the Middle East have never developed a consciousness. Hey, we were raped by the Arabs. This is not our religion, it's not our culture. Taken by others, we want to liberate ourselves from that. You can find one in a million that talk like that. Everybody else just goes along with it. Now, if you're Jewish, you get used to this, because this, this is a new reality. The second place Jews lived was in the Byzantine Empire, which is over there. That's what's left of the Roman Empire, East Roman Empire, which was Christian, and pretty doggone anti-Semitic. But there were Jewish communities there. There were. Okay? And the third place is what you and I call Christendom. Uh, this here, here, this is Charlemagne's Empire, you know, the Italy... France, Western Germany, and all that, which we know will eventually develop into the map that you and I are familiar with today. This is where the Jews lived, 99% of them, in the early Middle Ages. They lived, most of them, in the Muslim area. 
Some lived in the East Roman Empire. The others, like the Ashkenaz, end up in the Western area, which they called the Frank, the Frankish Kingdom, the Holy Roman Empire, eventually, and all that stuff. Okay, now everywhere you have Jewish communities. Everywhere, each Jewish community. Let's go to the next one. Is all on its own. Not even the communities within the Byzantine Empire could control each other. Jews living in Istanbul or Constantinople, as they call it, do have their rules and their board of directors. The ones in Athens have their board of directors. The ones here, they do. Take the Muslim world. Well, there it's a little bit different, as we'll see. But fundamentally, though, it's true. If you live over here, nobody else can tell you what to do. You live over here, nobody's going to tell you to do. And so I'm raising the famous question that historians are always fascinated with, or they should be anyway, which is how did the Jews survive as Jews? In the absence of a state, in the absence of a church, and in the absence of geographical contiguity. I've said this so many times in my classes, I'm going to be blue in the face. But there's no other group I'm familiar with that has done that. There have been groups that have survived in the absence of a state, but they usually had like a church of some form or another. And if they didn't have that, at least they all lived in the same area, so they had geographical contiguity. But you know as well as I that the Jews are scattered everywhere, all over the place, far apart from each other very often, and living in very different cultural contexts and zones. And there never was even an attempt to get representatives of all the Jews together at any time before Theodor Herzl came along. It wasn't even an attempt. And so how did they stay on the same page? Why didn't we all go the way the Ethiopian Jews do, which just you know, went off in their own orbit? Why didn't the, these Jews go off in their own orbit and these Jews go off in their own orbit? But it's not true. All these people living in different places from Persia to Spain to Lithuania, kind of all the same pace, with variations, but minor variations. But pretty much it's, it, it, it's, it's fascinating, you see? So the Jewish people, Kal Yisro, in the Middle Ages, consisted not of a country, they consisted of the collectivity of these communities, which, as I just said, had no state or church or geographical contiguity. So what held them together? The answer is the common form of communities and the common culture. Everywhere you had what I just described, what had evolved. Okay? Uh, what was the common culture? After all, here they speak Yiddish, there they speak Arabic, someplace they'll speak place Turkish, whatever. How do you, what holds them together? Well, the high culture was the Talmud. That's what Abraham common. We get the Chumash and the Talmud. Uh, the thing that was, uh, the intense thing was the Talmud, but the Chumash is also important as well. Okay? Now, so that means that intellectuals could somehow or other feel they're on the same page even though they live very far apart. Um, but how did it happen that Claudius Yisrael Talmudized? As I said before, there was a time when this book never existed. Nobody knows. Uh, this is one of the great questions in Jewish history, but there's no good answer. It happened. That's why those who follow these sort of things know that Professor Chaim Salvation, you know, recently wrote a fantasy essay, which, he's, which he says is one, which he like conjectures, you know, how did it happen that you end up with Ashkenaz? Was there a third yeshiva, as he calls it over here, Surah Pumbadisa and X? You know what I'm saying? Meaning, he's, he's, he's being playful, but not, the idea is that the problem's not playful. We don't know how it happened that they started out, for example, in this community. I'll just give you an example off the top of my head. Um, there are fish in the Gemara that they argue. Some say it's kosher, some not kosher. You can be dog on shore. Some places the eldest kosher, and that's why you have such an opinion in Gemara. So they ate them. Other places, not. By the time the Gemara is finished, let's say, for example, it's not kosher. Let's say that's the conclusion. What do you tell me? We've always done it. My bubby was real religious, all the rest of it. Somehow or other it happens. <laughs> you see? Somehow or other it happens. It's interesting. Um, there must have been a lot of fights. Be a fly on that wall. <laughs> but tonight, in a, few, in a little bit, I'm going to tell you how I think it happened. I would simply point out that the sweep of the Talmud across the Jewish people, that they all came with the same idea, except that it's proven by the fact that the Kairites didn't and they were marginalized. The Kairites are those Jews who didn't get along with the program. Obviously. They said, where did this come from? Okay? It's not what we did until now. But they couldn't make it. Now, the Talmud, in all of its parts, is almost impossible to master if you don't have a Rashi, a Steinzelis, an art scroll, or something like that. So how could it be the supreme canonical text, 
but it was. So the situation was weird and anomalous. But Talmudic law had arrived in Jewish history by this time. Now I'm going to try to explain what happened at the jurisprudential level. This requires a little bit of knowledge about the history of the Jews in the post-Talmudic era, after the Gemara had been composed into written text, let's say the 600s. Okay? There comes now an interesting development, which is what I want to speak about, which we call the Tekufat HaGaonim, Tekufat HaGaonim, which is basically the 600s to 1,000, and that's a long time. Here's that wonderful book by my, famous, by my favorite historian, uh, Simcha Asaf. He has these wonderful um, essays on the subject. Really wonderful. Now, this was a distinct period in Jewish history and had unique features in terms of the history of Beis Din and Bati Din. First of all, there was the reality, the new host society of an unusual and unprecedented nature, meaning the caliphate, as I just told you before. The Arabs were nobody, they were camel jockeys. All of a sudden, they're not. They're the rules of the world. You have no idea what contempt they were held once upon a time. And then they fooled everybody and conquered everyone, and now they're the top dog. They're riding on everybody. Okay, so what happened very quickly, let's go to the next map, is they started out over here. Muhammad, by the time he died, had taken over this. One, two, three, his successors conquered this and then took over this. Then little by little, they knocked out the Iranians who were just shocked, as I said, that these camel jockeys are beating them. And they conquered all of Iran. And then they went this way. They even came close to knocking this out. This way, this way, this way, this way. So they were in a roll. You see what I'm saying? And that created a new reality in which you have a single empire with a single government and a single money and a single commerce uh, where all the Jews live. Okay? As I said, the Jews, as you can see in the map there, the Jews live in hundreds of kilos containing many hundreds, many hundreds of Beisdins. But they didn't. This empire was a caliphate. It was ruled centrally top down. There was the emperor. They call him the caliph. That's what it's an emperor. And it's an absolute ruler. You know, he has to listen to the rules of Islam. Within that framework, he appoints who's the governors and this and that and the other. Of course, there was always trouble. He had civil wars, but nevertheless, usually the system is the top dog is the top dog. Interestingly, the Jews came to imitate the Muslim system during this period with their equivalents of this. Very often in Jewish history, they have a faux equivalent of what they see the Goyim doing. And so you had, not the Caliph, but you had the Exilarch, the Reish Galusa, in, in Israel. Well, let's say the Reish Galusa, who lived, in, in, who lived where the Arabs lived. He was like a Jewish Caliph. Okay? Early on, as I said before, when the Arabs busted out, started invading, very early on in 636, when they came to here, look, there's Arabia, here's already Iraq, with Babel. That's where the yeshivas were, the big Jewish communities. When they came in here, the Jews said like this, okay, we're not giving you no trouble, which is true. And Ali, the famous Arab general, who was a caliph for a short while, his murder is the cause of the Sunni versus the Shiites. Ali is the son-in-law of Muhammad. Uh, they have in the Igeris or Shiragon. They say he was met by the rabbis, they got along great. They had a l'chaim together. Uh, actually, they didn't have l'chaim, they didn't drink. But they had something together, fruit juice. And... Um, Ali even um, gave to Bustanai, who was the Reish Galusa, a Persian prince from the captured Persian uh, uh, emperor. You know, in other words, once they killed, took over the main Persian things, they gave out all of his wives and girls to different people. They gave one to Ali, which of course created a huge scandal in the firm world, but we won't go into that now. I'm simply pointing out that... Um, the Jews and the Arabs got along. The Jews made it their business to get along. And therefore, the Arabs, who are now the rulers, will tolerate guys like Bustanai, and they'll say like this, you can be the head Jew, like I'm the head Muslim. Obviously, you're under me. And obviously, if I feel like it, I can knock you down anytime I want. Once those rules are accepted, which are obvious, so you have a position at court, you have a retinue, you have a chashivas, you're accorded respect. And so it wasn't exactly, you know, um, like a king, but it's very similar to a king. Matter of fact, it's very famous 
All these guys like Ali got knocked off one after the other. I mean, all these early caliphs were assassinated. And that's just how it went. And the famous Arab historian who says that he ran into a Rish Galus, he said, I guess, look at the difference between you and me. I walk around without any guards. The Jews kiss my hand, give me money, support me in style because the Rish Galus is consent from David ML. So he's like a stickle Jewish king. I need bodyguards. You can't go anywhere without the Secret Service. You see? So anyway, the point is that uh, the Muslim rulers were willing, in fact, comfortable with having, so to speak, a Jewish caliph because that way it's all centralized. If I don't like what they're doing, you're, you, you pay the price. I have a one-stop shop. A guy I can talk to to say, keep your Jews in line or do this or tell them to do this or that. Okay. And remember, a huge fact, which is always there with the Jews living in the Islamic territories, which the Jews leveraged, a new threat. They're weak. They have no political ambitions whatsoever. They're waiting for a Messiah to come down from heaven. They're not doing anything now. So therefore, they're not like the Christians. Throughout the Islamic empire, there are a lot of Christians. And they're always hating the fact they're under the Muslims and are always plotting with their fellow Christians Knock these guys out. I don't blame them. That's unnatural. Who were the Jews plot? Who were all over the place? Who were they plotting with? Nobody. You see? So the caliph, then the Arab authorities know we gotta watch the Christians. You don't have to watch the Jews. You see? Maybe they might cheat you a little here and there. They are no security threat at all. Okay? Um, I'm told it's like that in Singapore today. You see? They're, they're worried about Chinese. Red China, they're worried about Malayans, they're worried about the Muslims, this and the other. Guy walks in with a Hasidic outfit, they got no problem with that whatsoever. You are not the profile of the threat. You see? So the new political but also cultural reality was Islamic, and the Jews imitated the Muslims in many ways. In fact, the two religions looked alike in many institutional forms. Many institutional forms. There's no priesthood in either one. By the time we're talking about the Kohanim or Advajab, so there's no priesthood. In the, in the Catholic religion, there's a priesthood. In the Islamic there's no priesthood. Okay? There's a scholarly class. Well, that's called Tamir Chacham. When you see these Muslim clerics, and all, I mean, they, that's a level of scholarship. That's all it is. Who studied and interpreted sacred texts from which laws are de derived divine in origin. That's what the Jews do. That's what the Muslims do. In the Islamic communities, the important guy is the judge appointed by the government. You see where I'm going. As the Arabs set up the caliphate, first it was headquartered in Damascus on the first dynasty and then eventually in Baghdad. Baghdad is where the yeshivas were. Baghdad is in the middle of Iraq. It's very near Sur and Pumadisa. So it's as if the world government that was set up is, you know, next door to Lakewood. Something like that. Okay? So the Jews in the Arab Empire came to establish a somewhat similar setup, especially when it came to Basin. Already in the time of the Gemara, there had emerged in the Middle East, though not necessarily elsewhere in the diaspora, a system of licensing and appointing of Dayanim to serve in various Jewish communities in Kehillahs. This is something you have in the Talmud times. In the areas around Israel, the appointments to the judiciaries were made by the Nasi. Once at a time, there was such a position called the Nasi, the patriarch. In Bavel, in the Persian Empire, these appointments were made by the Reish Galusa. This is discussed in the Talmud. It's old. That they give you the, in fact, that's what smicha originally is. The real smicha. You, you, you're now empowered to be a judge and paskin and all the rest of it from the highest authority. Um, as, you know, all these terms, yori, yori, yon, yon, they're in the Talmud. Now, both of these positions in the time of the Gemara, Mishnah, whatever, were positions that they come from Dovah Amela, they have tremendous prestige, and they're viewed as the authoritative people in setting up judiciaries. However, over the course of time, as happens with any dynastic situation, the father was smart and the son's not so smart. And the grandson's mama should nothing. He's just a grandson. It happens. And so there was a decline of the patriarchate and the decline of the exilarchate until it came to a point where just because somebody's a Reish Galusa doesn't mean he's a big Talmud Chacham. Now, sometimes it could happen, as we all know, in the beginning in Palestine and Israel, Hillel was a big guy. The Bira Nasser was a big guy, obviously, of Gamliel. But if you get to Gamliel the fifth, you know what I mean? And this guy the fourth, you haven't heard too much about them. 
they presided, but they weren't the big scholars. Now, um, the scholars in the yeshivas, therefore, began to play more important roles in all this, including in the appointments process. So by the time you get a situation, we have a Reish Galusa, for example, or a Nasi in Eretz Yisrael, depending on what you're talking about. And he's no big scholar at all. Everybody gives him prestige. They stand up when he walks in the room. He has certain zechuyos, no question about it. But if it comes to a Shiloh, you're going to talk to Rish Lakish, or, you know, somebody like a Ravashi. If that's the case, so the situation will be like this. Who should we appoint to be the judges in this far-off community? If the Rish Galusa is smart, and they weren't always, they'll say, I guess, what do you think? Who would you recommend? You see? And then I'll give it the stamp of approval. So it's a complicated development. Now, a very important point. At a certain point, the Sanhedrin ceased to exist, which means there was no more smicha. Once upon a time, there was an institution going Moshe Rabbeinu's time of what the Greeks called the Sanhedrin. We have different names, but let's call it Sanhedrin. And they had Ishmi Piish, according to the Jewish tradition, the smicha going back to Moshe Rabbeinu. I'm not talking about smicha today, I'm talking about the real thing. Today, the word smicha is just a joke. I'm not talking about at that time. Without actual smicha, there are many laws cannot be administered. Knas, dinin nefashos, capital crimes. We'll return to these later. The key point in all this was that the judges, in the time I'm talking about it, and in the area I'm talking about, which is the Middle East, shall we say, that we showed you for the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, the judges were not chosen locally, but were sent from above, which is interesting. So it's kind of, I mean, in America, we have a funny system. Some judges are elected. I think we have one here. And other judges are appointed. Isn't that right? Appointed. They have to go through a process, but appointed from the top. What if the public doesn't say, it says, I don't want this. Well, they got, you, it's not, the choice is not for you. Every time there's a Supreme Court appointment, you know, half are happy, half are sad. You know, that's how it goes. So the key point was in these early centuries, the judges were not lo uh, chosen locally. We were sent from above. That's the period of the Gaonim. As long as the judges performed well, no problem. If problems arose, the local communities would complain to the patriarch or the exilarch, and the judge might get dismissed. As for who gets to make the appointments, or who got to influence the appointments, it's a function of the power struggle between the exilarch and the Gaonim. The Gaonim was what you would call today the Russia Shivas. They represent the scholars. It's not so different than the American system in which any time there's a big judicial appointment, especially Supreme Court, it's a tug of war between different factions. You see? It's a comp competition for influence. And that's how it goes. Um, the word gone means the Rosh Yeshiva of the two yeshivas. There were two big yeshivas and only two. Surah and Pumadis like Harvard and Yale. And whoever was the head had the title His Excellency, the Gaon. You see? So usually what they did, I mean, it varied over the century. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but they worked out different arrangements. Um, for example, they might say, uh, all the judicial appointments, I'll make this up, all judicial appointments in Maryland and Virginia will go to Sura. All the judicial appointments in New Jersey and Delaware will go to Pumadisa. All the Jewish judicial appointments in Pennsylvania will go to the Gaon. That way, every, you, know, you divvy up the pie. That's one way. But, you know, those things never work down because it always works out that one wants to take over the other. And that's the politics of those centuries. Okay? The key point is that the Gon were the exilarch in, 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 in Babel, because by the time you get to the Arabs, they're the ones who counted. The Israel Center fell apart. The Gon would appoint a graduate from the two yeshivas to move to a community to kill and serve as a Zion. So let's say it's the year 750 or 800 or 850. And let's say you're talking, I don't know, Damascus. And there's a Jewish community there. Who's the basin? Well, at that time, I shouldn't use Damascus, but I will just to make a point. Um, if there is a vacancy on the judiciary, the Gaonim or the uh, Reish Galusa, some, whoever's in charge, will send a qualified guy. And that was what we say today, grad, a, a, a law school graduate. He has smicha. Not smicha, because there wasn't a real smicha, but he graduated. He's a senior scholar, he's competent in these areas of law, uh, from Surin Pumbadisa, from those two yeshivas. And so you have a certain amount of professional competence, as we would say today. 
The community didn't elect him, they had no say, but they had to pay his salary. The Dayan, therefore, was basically responsible to Baghdad, to the guys that appointed him, not to the local Kehillah, and that many could be impartial. Because I don't owe you guys anything, I'm not beholden to anybody, I'm beholden to the guy at the top, which is the theory of judicial appointments in this country. Right? That's the theory. Now, the Dayan would move to a town, typically would select two people from the community to serve with them as subordinate colleagues, because they didn't want to pay three salaries. So what he do is he said, I'm the main guy. I'm looking around. Who in this town knows anything? E either has street smarts or has some Torah knowledge. Some. You know, eh, eh. okay, you and you, we're now the basin. Obviously, when we had the session, somebody would be running the show. But you want three. You see? The three of them would constitute the basin, and the board of directors was expected to carry out its verdicts. This is how it was in the Middle East. During the Tukufa Sagonin. Now, obviously, politics is always there. Don't push it too far. If you tell the board of directors, you know, they all have to resign tomorrow, it's not going to work too well. You have to work with common sense. But within that, they might say, listen, this community, I don't know, there's too much talking and show. Therefore, we're going to make a takana, something like that, that, you know, we're splitting the minion into two parts, or whatever it is. You see? Um, the Basin would then appoint a formal and an informal cipher, or what they call cipher de Dino. And that meant for the Jews, no document, religious or commercial, was valid if not executed by this official. That's what you call in this country, what you call notaries and things like that. Right? In other words, from then on, the Basin controls the legalities of the financial arrangements. If there's a deed of sale, there's an inheritance you know, a document, you know, anything like that. Property stuff, it's got to go through the basin, be written by the sofer, under the direction of the basin, and then you can come with a claim if something happens. That's a way of centralizing control and normalizing, I'm using the word norm as in the terms of legal norms, normalizing procedures. Because then everybody knows, if you want to buy a house, this is how you're going to do it. There ain't no other way. Right? If you want to give a gift, something like that, you've got to go through these guys and, and write the, the, the document this way and that way. And this is how they set it up. That way, the basin can make sure that nothing was done in contravention of Jewish law. Jewish law. These official dayanim are the ones who organically introduced Talmudic law into the communities. That's my contention. This is how it happened. It could be that until now, they used to say, you know, like uh, Huckleberry Finn, you know, we cut our thumbs and touch it together, and that's a contract. Now comes these new guys in the 700s, 800s, 900s, and 10 hundreds. They say, eh, this blood business don't work. You've got to have something called a contract. It has to be two copies, and it can only be written by this guy. And we will make sure that he adheres to a formulary. As we give him, you know, uh, what's the right word? Templates to work with. And therefore, everything will be done according to Talmudic law. So people are discovering, oh, so the blood business don't work, or from now on you've got to do this and this business. And you always need two witnesses. Why isn't one witness good enough? We never had a problem with one witness. Can't use relatives. You don't trust my Zaidi? You know? The guy who trusted diamonds with him. You don't trust my Zaidi? You can't explain it. Well, the law is Moshe and Aaron can't testify together in court. Moshe and I cannot testify together in court. They're introducing into these communities, what we call the Talmudic norms that you and I are familiar with because we've been pretty much for the last thousand years. Okay? This is actually how the Talmud spread because if it's the source of law, then people want to familiarize themselves with it. Right? So if this guy's a businessman, and says, oh, now this is how it goes, I want to learn those rules. I may not necessarily be interested in how do you do the carbon peso, but I do want to know how you do a Kenyan on Kaka. I want to know all the loopholes. You see? They soon discover, to their horror, that the Talmud is not a simple law book. It's not a Maimonidean code that anybody can read. On the contrary, it's a lifetime task, because we're talking before Rashi existed and before Art School existed. See? So how do you deal with the Talmud, which is a mass of words, assuming that you have the whole text, which is probably not so common, and you're trying to make sense out of it. But it's the Word of God. So you've got to listen. Now, as I said... There must have been such, some pushback to all this, but these judges were backed by the power of the state, the Islamic state. 
they were backed by the power of the exilarch, and the exilarch was backed by the caliph. So if the Jewish court says, he owns the house, and he doesn't own the house, this guy can raise holy hell, we're going to get the Muslim police to come and kick you out. And if you give us any trouble, we'll get you whipped. The Jews won't do it, but the police will listen to what the court, Jewish court says. And there are a few cases that we have where the local Muslim guy was kissed up to by some Jew, and he overrode what the court said, and this and the other. And invariably, at the end, he went to the Jewish judge, and he said, you know, I regret it. I made a mistake. Uh, I don't know. Because if you have a court, then, this is, then we got it back to courts. Either you have a law and order society or you don't have a law and order society. You see? It's very interesting. Now, the Reish Galusa was institutionally a high official at the Caliph's court under the Dimi system and the Pact of Omar, you know, you know that the Jews are inferior and all. But having granted that, he's the head Jew. Okay? So his officials, including the judges, have to be feared, and they were certainly respected. Now, in the more western provinces of the Caliphate, that's more like Syria, Egypt, Israel proper, and all the rest of it. Appointments were made by the Israeli power center, which is a more complicated phenomenon. Not many people are aware of this. They think the Gaonim ruled the roost from Baghdad everywhere. They did and they didn't. Once upon a time, as we know, there had been the Nazis, the patriarchs of the, of the base Hillel, who had a real Sanhedrin, but the Byzantines destroyed all that somewhere in the years 340, 350 to 450. After that, from 450 to 650 in Israel, the Jews in Israel were downtrodden and persecuted. That's why Jewish scholarship languished. The most you have is religious poetry. If you go to some of these synagogues, it was the Byzantine era, you see Avodah Zara, <laughs> all kinds of things, in the synagogues, you know, in, in the mosaics and things like that, because they didn't know much better. You know. They went with what they had. During all this time that Israel was crushed by the Christians and the Jews were busted and downtrodden, in Babel, things were chugging along, merrily. And so Babylonia became the central place, not Israel. When the Muslims conquered everything in the 600s, that brought relief and revival to Palestine. And so the Israelis tried to set up a patriarchate, plus a prestige yeshiva to compete with the Babylonian Jewish elites, but they had limited success. And there are famous fights over this. Um, they wanted Tiveria to be like Surin Pumbadisa. It didn't work. And so it was this group, the one in Israel out of Tiveria, that appointed the judges in the West. So if you look at this map, which really shows the Arab civil wars, so for our purposes, right over here would be the area where the judge is appointed by the top guy in Israel. Here is the judge appointed by the top guy in Baghdad. In either way, they're appointed from top down and not elected by the local communities. That's what makes the Tukufas and Onim so interesting in the context of the, Jew, uh, the jurisprudential history. Okay? Now, it's not clear whether they applied to Bavli or Yushami, but I won't go into that. Either way, we now, have to, we, we now have to get into the nitty-gritty of how exactly these courts operated and exactly what powers did they wield. After all, as I mentioned above, there wasn't any smicha anymore at that time, which under Talmudic law was necessary to adjudicate various types of cases. Okay, so you tell me like this. Can't adjudicate these type of cases. And what if they pop up? You know? Can't punish a murderer. Can't, hit, can't apply malchus anymore. So what if we got a murderer here? Running amok. What do we do? Can't do this. Anymore. And what if we have a child molester here? So what do we do? Nothing? What if we have a guy that requires a canals because of the way he's running the business? Nothing? You see what I'm saying? The reality ran into the theory like that. Okay? That's the problem. As I mentioned above, there was no more smicha. So what are they supposed to do when these cases popped up as inevitably happens in the course of life? There was no Sanhedrin to legislate anything. They couldn't create new drabonans. Once the Talmud is over, you're not allowed to make a new drabonan. You can only legislate locally. What I'm drawing your attention to is the difference between yeshiva learning nowadays, which yeshiva learning exists in an imaginary world. The theoretical world is a better word to put it. Right? You have a malva and a lova and this. Now, you know, the guys are discussing back and forth, and a mazik and a nizik, and if his ox gored that guy's cow and so forth. But they don't see it. It's a theoretical. You get it? It's a theoretical. It's glorying at the level. That's what the briskers <laughs> It's glorying at the level of theory. Okay? Now, um, that's one way. I'm talking about the world of basins. 
and where cases have to be adjudicated and often require modification of the Talmudic laws. But they couldn't make new drabonas, as I said before. They couldn't legislate in them. What developed in the Tekufas of Gaonim was that the two Gaonic yeshivas did make changes and adjustments. They didn't call them drabonas, but takonos, which sound more temporary and flimsy. Sounds like it's just an emergency situation, even though it might last for a thousand years. Because on the one hand, there was iron necessity of life to do something. On the other hand, the two Gonik Yeshivas were willing to issue these kind of rulings because they had a great deal of self-confidence. So therefore, um, you have the theory of Knas, which is you can't impose financial penalties. So how are you going to run, a, a, you know, how are you going to impose penalties? So he said, well, we're you know, we're, we're not doing it. We're, doing, we're just acting as the agents of the ones in Israel. You see? So no, there's, but the bottom line is we're going to do it. They constructed a theory to enable them to do it over here. Um, thus, we have all kinds of adjustments in the marriage uh, property laws. There are all kinds of rules in Ksuvis, which now they're doing in the Dafiomi, about issues of marriage property. In the Goni period, they enacted all kinds of changes to that when they felt, you know, uh, can be governed from a Talton, not only from Karka, things like that. Uh, because they said, you know, we see that this is a necessary thing and we're just doing it, okay? Um, they were, they, you're going to find uh, the death penalty for most of them. Where they, anybody they identify as an informer, that's going to kill them. Um, sometimes with the power of the state and sometimes just off the books, which theoretically is not allowed, but maybe it is. Uh, I mean, killing somebody who's an informer, absent due process. You see, it's not like you're a notorious informer and we have 10 uh, people who warned you and, you know, we call you into court and we say, stop doing this or else, and all the rest of it. Often that's not possible. So we just identify this person as a, a Moser. And as they say today, everybody knows about it. Next thing you know, he disappears. An accident at Bottom River. Thus you have, I'm just trying to show you that in the period of the Gonin, who were very powerful and self-confident, the courts, which are under them, they're appointing the judges, were prepared to issue all kinds of modifications and changes here and there to existing laws in order to make the communities work, life work. Thus you have a mass hafkos kedushim, which kedushi tzchoka, kedushi tarmis, and chorusam by Behuda Gon. There's um, a problem, I said before, it's too easy to get married, too hard to get divorced. And so what you had in Khorasan, which is now part of Iran, I guess, uh, we had kedushim. These guys are at the bar and they're gambling. The guy runs out of money. It happened a lot. And the guy says, Well, if you win the next round, I'll have any money, you marry my daughter. <laughs> She's living. It's not funny. You see? And these things were done. And all kind of stuff like that happened. After all, from the age of three to whatever, the father can do it. God, God and, it's, and the Talmud says, You can do it. Well, Rabbi Yehuda Gaon, well, these guys, he said like this, I'm declaring all the marriages c contracted in the last two years in Khorasan to be bottled. Nobody's married anymore. Because I, I'm not going to put up with this. D really? I mean, you can do that? We're doing it. You see what I'm saying? So in other words, things are pretty radical. And there are various forms of abuse of this. There's Kedushi Sheshbej, there's Kedushi Sechot, there's Kedushi Tarmis. Like I said, the guy's got it all in the Fryman book. He's got all these different ways. You know, I see a rich girl. I go with two friends, two low-life friends, and let's say the girl's 13 years old, 12 years old, and I say, hold this book. And she holds the book. I say, and she said, what just happened? Well, she didn't say no. She had, if she was smart, but how should she be? She throws down with it. I know. She didn't do that. I said, what's going on over here? I said, okay, now you're married to me. Uh, if we want to get out of this, your father is Reichman. He said, okay, pay up. You see what I'm saying? These, it's, it's, it lends itself to all kinds of things. Now, as I say, I hope to get back to this. But the Christians could make drabonans, if you follow what I'm saying. They viewed themselves as able to make laws. Um, that's what the Catholic Church is all about. And so in already in the 500s, they had this problem in the Council of Seville in the early 600s, they passed a law in Catholicism 
No marriage counts unless it's performed by a priest. You get it? That stops somebody from doing that. They even said you have to have bands. They have to announce it two weeks ahead. It was all too, it makes a sense. They didn't see that they could do that. But the guy, it got such a point that he's willing to be mafkir, all the conditions. You have, they'll impose when they, if somebody does something wrong, they'll do the ultimate disgrace in the Middle East. They'll shave the guy from top to bottom. You walk around bald and with no beard in that society, as a shame, the person would rather die maybe or something like that, I'd rather get whipped, you see? So we warned you three times to stop keeping your store open. You keep your store open on Shabbos, we'll shave you from top to bottom. These are not Talmudic laws, okay? Jail. In Talmudic law, there's no jail. In fact, in most societies, there's no jail. I'm talking about jail as a punishment. You forget prison as a punishment. That's rather modern. That's Michel Foucault's famous book, Discipline and Punish, right? Prison as a punishment was dreamed up by this Italian guy in the Marquis de Beccaria. Prison was always a place where you hold people till the trial. It's a place for political prisoners. In England, it's a place to make you pay your debts. You see, it's not the punishment itself. It's not you hold up a store, your punishment is to spend two years or five years or whatever in jail. Beccaria thought we'll rehabilitate them in jail. Uh -huh. Yeah, I agree. So I'm just trying to say, in the Gaoni period, you'll have Jewish jails, which they feel it's necessary to impose these kind of penalties that people won't listen to this or that or the other. None of this is in the Gemara. Maiming, in rare cases. Kohanim shemizchatim in grushos lom noam em nesiyas kapayim. If there's a Kohen who marries somebody who's not allowed to marry, I'm a Kohen. You can't marry a grusha. Divorcees. What if the guy did? He said, hell with it, I'm doing it. They'll cut off the top of the finger. Why? Can't do it anymore, you balmo. You see? Now, that's not real maiming. I mean, I could say maybe later in the Middle Ages I get the real maybe. But again, it's not real in the Talmud. It sort of is. It says so-and-so cuts you out of, you know, it's, but it's, it's not normative legal practice. But they say like this, listen, we're running these communities, we're making the orders, if people only live in the basin, then they will pay a price. Various forms of shunning, ostracism, excommunication. You have this in the Gemara to some degree. You have it much more now with the courts in the Islamic world. I mean, really, everybody will shut you out. You get, they'll shun you. You walk down the street and nobody looks at you, that kind of thing. But they didn't do dinay nefashas. They didn't do capital crimes. That the Islamic government wouldn't let them do. That was reserved for the Arabs, for the courts of the caliph. So in other words, all the Jewish court could say was, we got a Jewish guy who murdered somebody. You guys take over. Which is what we do in Baltimore, Maryland. Right? What, God forbid something like that terrible happens in Baltimore, Maryland. And what do you do? You, you, you call the cops. <laughs> that means we're telling the state. If we can't do it, you do it. You see? Um, th this was required by the caliph. Those are the rules. So they had a certain amount of autonomy. This is what we find in what we call the response to the Shalas and Shubas Gonim. They bespeak the autonomous, coercive community. Autonomous, coercive community. But where the judiciary is form formally independent of the community, it worked for a number of centuries in that Islamic part of the world, and it reflected an era when the Jews, at least in the caliphate, had some kind of a state, even if it was a faux state. There was some kind of a Jewish structure out there. There is a guy who has power and he appoints officials. It's not a state, like a state state. It's a state, you see? And I just want to... I'm about to finish, uh, get this point across, because it's far removed from our reality today. Once upon a time, to be a Jew, meant, well, I'm from Avram Avinu, you know, I'm from Jewish people, I believe in the Torah, I believe in God, I keep the missus, and, and I live in a Jewish state. So what are you talking about? The Jewish state had been gone a long time ago. Well, if we don't live in a 100% Jewish state, we live in a 50%, a 20% Jewish state. Here in Baghdad, here in Damascus, here it is. We live in an area in which the Jewish community has some kind of real power, like a state. I mean, it's limited. It's what the Arabs will allow. It's this and that. True. All that's true. But to the degree that the Jews have some sort of coercive power, they were viewed as a source of pride. 
We in America are very far removed from that way of thinking. I'm trying to take you, take the glasses off of the year 2022 and put in the glasses of the year 922, and then you'd think like that. Okay? The exilarch, as I said, carried himself like a mini king. The Gaonic yeshivas conducted public sessions in which they imitated the mores of the Persian court. You know, the head guy would come in like the king. There was a bow to him, and they would ask permission. It was a whole long ceremonials. Anything that deviated from strict Talmudic laws, well, there are Talmudic precedents for deviating from Talmudic laws. But the hour is late, so we'll look at that next time. Good night. Yeah, if there anybody wants to down my, they'll go in. I already down my, but uh, if they want down my, they'll be in the show next door. Base matters. What, Mondays and Wednesdays. Monday, Wednesday. This Wednesday. This Wednesday? This is every Monday, Wednesday for the next three weeks. I think I have a counter example. Mm-hmm. I'm listening. Church, contiguous area. Uh, they have a they have a church. They have some central business that they all. So there's a top there's a top there's tax in charge. Of so to speak, I don't know how good, but they have their head honchos. They do. They live in their old parallel universe. They have they have a certain kind of thing. Quick question. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned the schools were not run by the Kihila. Yeah. But they were paid for, right? Weren't they? No. They didn't tax the communities to pay for it? That's a funny thing. Really? So when did that start? It never started. It's still not there today. Bengama? I, I thought... I thought they always had the time. parents up for the tuition. It's, always? Yeah, really? I, I know it sounds funny. There you had. Because everyone says, oh, well, once upon a time... No. Well, taxed and let me put it this way. Sometimes in some places, they would run a school for the very poor. Uh-huh. So you had to be means tested. Uh-huh. You know, that's called Talmud Torah. Bengamla's time yeah. didn't do that? Uh, we don't know what they did in Bengamla's time. Because Bengamla's a full I'm, I know very well, but I'm saying we have no idea how they ran that into it. Even though maybe, maybe in his time they ran it to be a free or something. Uh-huh. We don't know. I was talking about the gills in the middle.